Acting is wonderful, success is wonderful, but it's not fulfilling in the inside. It doesn't fill you from the inside. It, it, it adorns you on the outside, but... Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting On The Brink from Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those people watching us from around the world, British Columbia is obviously one of the most beautiful provinces in Canada. Prince George is 500 miles or 800 kilometers north of Vancouver. We have a very special guest today. Her name is uh, Cherry Copperley and she is an actress or was and still is an actress and a model and at the same time has an extremely interesting story and uh, Cherry, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you are physically now in Florida. What location are you in, uh, Cherry? I'm just in the countryside outside of Tampa on Out the pa- west coast. At, at the west coast of uh, Florida. And uh, uh, so beautiful weather there right now or what is the temperature i think i brought california weather with me here because (laughs) last year when i moved here at this time i had a tan a golden tan within a couple weeks yeah and this been cold and rainy so i'm i'm thinking i brought california weather here unfortunately goodness yeah so Tell us a little bit about your, you know, you're an actress and you're a model, uh, were, or, and then you made changes and uh, you had experiences in, uh, in being not only a movie star or being uh, in a model uh, very highly rated. So, and then you made changes to your life. So tell us a little bit about where, where were you born your schooling and then how did you get into the career that you chose initially well i was actually born in a a small outskirts of hollywood about an hour from hollywood a place named covina and um i was raised there just a normal girl that actually uh, never got invited to the prom. I, I've never been to a prom. Um, but anyway, I, I went towards Hollywood because I used to say as a young girl, I'm not living here. I'm going over there where I couldn't see. And, and then I decided, well, actually my mom was working and I went to pick her up and they were doing a movie and it was called Hometown USA. And as I went to pick up my mother, the somebody there said to me, honey, do you want to be in our movie? And I said, okay, well, he was asking me to be an extra and to go dress up in fifties clothes and come back. Well, they ended up making me like a stand in with the star and which is like if, if, if he's driving down the street, I would pretend to be the actress, but no one really sees my face. And I just said, I want to be an actress. And so then I um, found out that this man was making a movie and I had my mother call him on the phone and say um, that she was an old friend from high school of his, which was not true. And, um, And when he got on the phone, then I grabbed it and said, I know you're making a movie and I want to come and audition. And it was, it was Blue Lagoon that Brooke Shields ended up doing. And he said to me, actually, yeah, he let me come in. He said, we don't that. And I said, please, please. And he said, all right, I'll tell you what, if you can be here by six o'clock, I'll see you. Well, I was from an hour away and I was young. I was, I think I was 16 and just barely driving. I drove into Hollywood. I was late, but he still was there. He saw me and he said to me, honey, 
I need an 18 year old that um, looks like they're 16. You're 16 and you look like you're 18. And he, anyway, he said, you know, it's very nice meeting you, but no. And so I was crying and I left his office and pushed the button to get on the elevator. And a gentleman was coming out of his office and looked at me and said, are you an actress? And I said, no, but I want to be one. And he gave me his card and said, call me. And it was the Meyer Michigan agency, which was a huge talent agency. And Meyer Michigan actually was an agent that even in the early eighties was still, he was the last Hollywood um, studio agent. So he was a man, an agent that loved to discover talent. No talent. So, so he brought me in and I met with him and, and he said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, he was a, just a short little man. He was so cute. He said, um, I want you to come back here uh, next week and I want to see you again. Well, when he came back, he had Lee Marvin there and he left me in the room with Lee Marvin. And now, to, Lee Marvin, is that a movie star? The name sounds familiar to me. He was a big movie star, a, a tough guy, like movie star in the 50s, you know? Right. But I didn't know who he was. So his, his idea didn't really work because I had no clue who Lee Marvin was. He was just another man. To yeah. And so he left me with Lee to see how I could handle myself with famous people or, you know, important people. And then he, he, Lee said, she's great, whatever. He sent me out for an audition and I met with a, a casting agent named Meryl O'Loughlin and Meryl O'Loughlin hired me. So now you still, how old were you then, uh, Terry? Like, um, I probably was 16. 16. Still 16 eh, in that area. Now, now, just to go back a little bit, is that your mom, she was already working in Hollywood, but lived in just north of Hollywood? My mother never worked in Hollywood. My mother was a banker. Okay. I, was, I was just a normal girl that grew up in the suburbs of LA. Right. And nothing special i i was a girl that like i told you didn't even get in um asked to the prom how okay. come so, Be because you're very normal and and uh you know so didn't you want to or did you or was it no, no boy ever asked me so <laughs> i never went i was but when i was young i was very skinny you were what very very skinny. Oh, very skinny. Yeah. So, and, and so you didn't feel good about that yourself then? or? Well, only because they used to make fun of me. Right. And they would tell me, you know, like, like I was a zipper, if I turned sideways, you know, they made fun of how skinny I was. And so I don't think I was very attractive to the Did boys. you have siblings or? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had two older brothers and a younger sister. Okay. So when I, but when I got to Hollywood, it was a totally different story. They were like, who are you? Where did you come from? Wait here. Every audition I went on, they would say to me, can you wait here? Do you have a few more minutes? Can I go get the director? Can I go get the producer? And basically up until I auditioned for We Got It Made, they said, when I walked in and said my lines, they said, you're hired. So, so we, we, uh, You Got It Made, that was a movie, that was a series, right? When, yes. when what period did that play? Because it was shown internationally, right? Yeah, that was in 1981, um, 82, 
and then 83, 84. It came, it, we got, we went off the air, then we came back in 83, 84 for another year. <clears throat> but I just had a small town girl innocence that was, when they were looking for a dumb blonde, I didn't play a dumb blonde. I played, I just was innocent. So it came off dumb, but it was not, it, maybe it wasn't intelligent, but it was more innocent than the typical dumb blonde. Right. I think that's why they were like, you're hired. Are you real? Can you wait here? Because I was just a small, a girl from a small town that was like, you know, just so wide eyed and innocent and pure. I was and just. You're still, you're still living in your, with your parents then? Or you, were you, yeah. And you were um, like commuting? Yeah. By the time I did, we got it made. I actually was, had just gotten married and um, I just had moved from my parents and my mom. I, I was raised by a single mother. Right. And um, yes, yeah, so I was living with her and then I got married and moved in with my husband at that time. Right. And, and so then you got into the acting. Yeah. And, then and I, so I, I interrupt you a little bit on your, I just want to make I, sure that people understand the, how things work down in the Hollywood area at that point. Well, I got one part, Fantasy Island, where I had one line and then, you know, had an agent. They came on the set during that, signed me to do a se another series. So, so you hired, uh, so how it works then is that uh, so if I aspire, not a, not me, but hi hypothetically speaking, uh, right. you know, then the key is to how do you get noticed? How do do uh, does do you run into? It's not much different in industry. If you're building a career, I'll talk about mine a little bit later. But you know that the key for me always was how do I get noticed? You know, like, uh, and, and because I'm plain and have nothing special to offer to a company or to whoever may I aspire to have me hired, then what do I have to offer? And to get noticed is the key probably. And for acting at, is finding that agency that believes that you have something to offer to the industry and they if they represent you financially that is an, uh, a benefit to them because uh, they will have the contacts that know what the movies or the the projects require and so the key is to be noticed so you were noticed already when you were 16 and then as you said the problem then was that you look like you were 18, but you were only 16. And so they had to wait until such a time I, as that you had reached that age, right? Yeah, until I was a little older, then I started. Right. Then I started getting the jobs. But um, I always say you're, the best way to be successful is to be uniquely you and to be unafraid exactly. so sometimes i would take chances i would what they would say like um let, let's say if i did an interview and i didn't feel like i did my best then i would say can i do it again and they i'd have to fight to do it again to let them do, let me do it again and then I would go in the office and put my legs up on the couch and, you know, make it mine. Make so that to do things that your true nature and your unique person can come out. And I think that's the biggest 
hindrance to most people's success in every area of life is they um, we tend to hold back who we really are because we're afraid. And when you're not afraid to be you, success happens. It, and that is so true, uh, uh, Cherry. Even in my mind, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, to have that confidence as to who you are and also saying, and that's what I say a lot of times now, I give a lot of presentations and interact a lot with young people and, 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 and people in business. And I say everybody is uniquely beautiful as to who they are. And, 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 and they have to become at peace with who they are and feel comfortable about it and saying that, uh, you know, that no matter what or no matter what anybody says or believes is not relevant. It is what you believe and how you feel about who and who you are. And everyone is uniquely different as to who they are. Uh, you know, like for myself, uh, is, uh, I'm 83 years old, just turned 83 on oh. November the 1st, actually, and uh, 83 years young, I call it, because I want to live till I'm 120. And, and, and so I was born in northeastern Holland uh, during the war years in 1940, November the 1st, 1940, and it was a tough go. And, uh, oh. you know, the, uh, we were liberated by the Canadian Army April the 12th, 1945 saw far too much of what we should not have seen. Things were extremely difficult, especially the winter 1944-45 uh, was called the hunger winter. Uh, and uh, there was nothing to eat because the Germans had cut off all food supply to those regions. And uh, it was the coldest winter on the record. So, uh, you know, my mom had three kids. My dad was drafted by the Dutch, uh, by the Dutch army but the last time they saw him was in Rotterdam before it was bombed and thousands of people died. So they did not know for five years he was dead or alive. And so she had to bring up three kids. Uh, I was, she was pregnant with me and I was born in November the 1st. My sister was one year older, my brother two years older. And we would go into, uh, you know, when already and uh, what I still remember is all the bombers overhead, uh, hundreds of bombers uh, bombing Germany, daytime, nighttime bombing from 1943 forward. And, uh, and I remember the winter of 1944-45 when uh, myself and, the, and my brother and my sister, we would go into the railroad yards with gunny sacks, pick up anything edible or burnable, and then, uh, you know, sat around a little stove in the evenings to keep warm. I still kind of, even still today, feel the feeling of hunger and then uh, and, and the heat and the cold and then the anxiety of losing that parent because everybody around you had the same issues and problems trying to survive and obviously saw far more, more than we should have seen. Uh, anyway, the, we got uh, liberated by the Canadian Army April the 12th, 1945. Uh, it made such an impression on me that I always knew from that point forward that, uh, uh, you know, that I wanted to go to the land of my heroes, uh, Canada, and uh, tried to go when I was 17. Uh, my parents wouldn't let me then. Then I was drafted into the Dutch Air Force, uh, you know, for about 30 months and uh, then went to Canada when I was 23 and started, uh, but I was not very successful in school. Uh, I failed uh, grade three and I failed grade seven three times. And then he said, what are we gonna do with this guy? Do we send him to the mentally challenged school or do we uh, get him to learn uh, a trade of some sort? And so they sent me to a furniture factory and uh, I became a furniture maker. But I never felt good about myself being young kind of relating to you and feeling that you were skinny and you, nobody asked you out uh, or to the prom and all those kind of things. I always felt then growing up that the f people that I went to school with and when I failed grade seven for the third time, the friends that I had then, 
you know, they, they can be hard on each other. And I now had become not anymore a student, but a laborer. I'm proud of that today, but then I wasn't. Uh, although I felt good about what I was doing, but uh, you know, the kids that I used to hang out with, uh, they, uh, they went on to college and then university and on and on and on. So I always kind of felt in a way that I had failed, although I was very optimistic and, and, and very go-go in a lot of ways, but I kind of had failed. And uh, I felt that uh, when I was 23, that going to Canada, I had to prove to me, not to anybody else, that I could do it just as well as anybody else could. In Holland, the way it used to be is that as you then grow up and you then at some point get married and you buy a house or you're looking for a job, the first thing they do is they ask, uh, where are your career? Uh, where are your diplomas? And they say, well, I didn't have any diplomas. And so, uh, you know, so that always is a challenge. So by then I felt I had to prove to myself that I could do it. So when I left uh, Holland in the summer of 1965, with one suitcase, two sets of clothes, three books, and $150, and uh, yeah. I was going to build a lumber mill in uh, British yeah. Columbia. That's where all the timber is. And uh, so I, I could speak the language, didn't know, so didn't have a job. And uh, by the time I got to Vancouver, I uh, went to the immigration office and uh, uh, fortunately there was a fellow that spoke German or there was a German and uh, I could speak some German and I, I told him what I wanted to do. I wanted to build a lumber mill and, and he said mm -hmm. Prince George then, where I am today, uh, is a boom town. It's, it was then. Lots of lumber mills, lots of pulp mills and that's where the future is. So off do I go on a Greyhound bus to, Van, to Prince George took about 12 or 13 hours. And I came off the bus here about three blocks away from here. I can virtually see it from here, was the Greyhound station and uh, came off the bus. And uh, as I came off the bus, I had my, my suitcase, my two sets of clothes and my three books. And I counted my money at least three times. I had uh, $25.47. And, uh, you know, the, but what I did have in, in abundance is attitude. I always have a positive attitude, even during the difficult times. If the day was a bad one, I would swear it's a better day tomorrow. I still do that today. I did that even when I was young. The second one that I have, the passion, whatever I do, I give it all that I got and I, you know, give it 150%. And the other one is work ethic. and. I work harder than anybody, and what will follow is success. And I still use that as my foundation today. And so then starting here with nothing, became a cleanup man, then a lumber pilot, and on and on and on. And then within two years, I was the superintendent of one of the larger lumber mills here in the region. And then within two and a half years, I was part owner of a little sawmill in the Yukon of all places. And the Yukon is that if you have British Columbia, if you look at the map, then you go north of British Columbia, which is about a thousand miles long. Prince George is in the middle, 500 miles. Then the Yukon is next to Alaska. And it's a place where it snows in July, and you don't know if it is early or late, and uh, that kind of a place. I was there for about five years. Uh, and then came back here, started my companies that I still have, the Brink group of companies, and we have a number of companies and uh, quite successful actually, but that's not what my story is about. It's that in spite of it all, and then, you know, then, but even then when I started my companies already, I was already in my 60s virtually, and, uh, uh, you know, I still had problems interacting with people. And by coincidence, I had somebody suggest to me, I go to Toastmasters. I don't know if you ever heard of Toastmasters. It's uh, where they talk about, if you Google it, it'd be interesting to see, is that's where they uh, focus on becoming good speakers and, and, and even more importantly, good listeners. And there are probably about uh, I would say 450,000 uh, people in Toastmasters 
mainly in North America, but also in Europe. There are probably in our town there is at least three or four or five clubs around that uh, where they do interacting on speaking, becoming good listeners, and then uh, thinking on your feet and. Uh, so I went down there and I said, what are they doing? And say, are they going to ask me any questions? They said, no, you know, just sit there. And then halfway through the meeting, they said, uh, somebody said, hey, John, tell us about you. And I said, oh, my God, I'll never go back here. Anyway, I stayed there for about 10 years. And it became one of the organizations that changed my life, in particular, becoming a better not only speaker, but a better listener and a better thinking on my feet, assuming that at some point that in my life I would do podcasting was totally unbelievable. That will never happen. I, I could not possibly do that, but obviously I do, and, and I'm still quite, I believe, quite successful at it. And, uh, you know, but the other part that changed my life is that in 1997, I was then, uh, uh, you know, al already, uh, you know, approaching 60 years old. Uh, I was 57 then. I walked into a store and I picked up a book and I opened the book and the book was called Driven to Distraction, written by Dr. Halliwell. And as I opened the book, it was about ADHD. I'd never heard of ADHD. And I said, oh, my God, that's me. And so I, I bought the book. I wrote in the book. Now I finally know who I am. And, and so I was already 57 years old, very successful in business, but it kind of it gave me clarity as to who am I and, and still feeling at that point that I had failed in a certain extent. Everybody said, oh, you're so successful. You got all these companies and blah, blah, blah. I didn't feel that way and until those pieces fell together. And then it took me five years before I went to my doc, the doc that delivered our two daughters and was a personal friend. And he said to me, hey, John, why are you here? I said, I think I got ADHD. And, <laughs> and then, yes, I do. And, uh, and, and so the more I found, I was ashamed of it then, especially when you're running or building this company and you go to the bankers and you make proposals for millions of dollars that you want to lend to build this, that, and the other thing. And then you say, oh, by the way, I got ADHD and say, well, have a nice day, right? So we're not interested, you know, but obviously that all of that now has changed. But, uh, you know, the, I felt more and more that, I had to become more vocal about it and about ADHD in particular and uh, include it now in my presentations. And then the other thing that I did is that uh, since that time, uh, now by then, when I was diagnosed, I was 62. And, and then, but over the years, people said to me, why don't you write a book about all the things that you're doing? And so I tried that writing book is not easy. And I tried it many times, start, stop, start, stop. And I knew five years ago, if I don't do it now, it will never happen. So I, I wanted to share not so much my success, but all the challenges along the way. I wrote a book and the, it's against all odds. And, uh, you know, quite successful. I'm going to send you a copy of it. I'm going to sign it. The other thing that I did is that after all of that is that ADHD, and I don't know how familiar you are with it, but I call it a superpower. I Where couldn't. Are you going I, fast? Pardon me? Or is pardon. that ADD? Is it ADHD when you go really fast? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, that's a good <laughs> expression, but it's, it's an attention deficit disorder, uh, ADD. Uh, it, in, it was looked at at one point as a disorder. It isn't. It, it allows you to do more things, but you can focus on things very well and do very well at it. Other things that are not fitting in your area of interest, you totally block it out. And so for me to go to school was something I had, I had no interest in 
uh, sitting in, in the classroom. And if I would get out of the classroom after work, then if they said to me, but, but, but did you discuss, I would have no idea. So I wrote a book about it. And, and, yeah. and although there are many books around already about ADHD, and, and so, but I felt I had to, A, I discovered it's a, dis, uh, it, it's, it's a superpower, there's no question about it. And a lot of people say to me, how do you do all the things that you're doing? As you have 10 companies, you, you're an author, and, and obviously you're writing books, and then you're a speaker, and, and then podcaster, and all of that kind of stuff. How do, how do you do it? They say, well, ADHD. And, you know, so I wrote this book about it, ADHD Unlocked. And, uh, you know, and, and it's a book that I wrote. You can start it anywhere. You can guide it forward or backward, backwards. And it's specially written with the mind of somebody that's ADHD. Make it interesting and uh, very popular. Actually, I'm going to sign one for you and send it to you as well. So that kind of... So for me then, I was a late bloomer. Started writing obviously, uh, as an author of working, uh, I wrote another book that I find a lot of people don't like what they are doing and they are changing their careers. You come to mind to a certain extent, but many other people are as well. And, and so I wanted to, it is so important to like what you're doing because if you don't like what you're doing, I heard on the uh, CNN of one of those channels, uh, that in the United States, 70% of the people that work don't like their jobs. And 75% of that 70% are looking for another job. Here, a lot of times when I interact with young people in particular, then I say, what are you going to do for a career? And say, I don't know. You know, so at some point you're going to have to kind of focus on it because it's so important that once you make those decisions, then find out about it, what those jobs are. If you want to become a welder or you want to become a truck driver, talk to people that are truck driving or an entrepreneur or you want to become an accountant or a lawyer. Talk to people that are doing those jobs so you understand them and, and then you can kind of make that selection as to what direction you want to go because if you don't, I know so many people even now that I talk to, they do a job and say, I don't like what I'm doing. I say, well, if you don't like what you're doing, change. Because otherwise you go home, you take it with you, and all the people around you are affected by the fact that you don't like really what you're doing. And uh, so I felt I had to write a book about it. So I wrote a book, is Finding Your Passion, Living the Dream. And if you ask me the question and saying, hey, John, are you living the dream? Absolutely, I am. Even now at 83, I still get up at 5.30 in the morning. I always think that I'm late. And I always make my bed, and then I, whatever day it is, uh, you know, usually I still work 60, 70 hours a week. And uh, I'm, I'm always in the hurry, go, go, go. And, uh, and I love every single day of what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, but it took me a long time. And that's kind of why I think it's important for me to share that with you. Because as I hear your story from, you know, from the time that you grew up, and that you really didn't feel you were accepted by the people around you, uh, that you didn't feel good about yourselves, and then all of a sudden you ended up in Hollywood where they had more appreciation for you, who you were, and what you could do, and, and obviously also, uh, you know, you were attractive and, and became more of that. And, and then I'm sure you're going to share with us as to why that was not exactly what you maybe wanted to do in the long term. And obviously you changed your life. But for me, what was important to share with you is saying that it took me till A, I had to start over again and start with nothing and then tell show to me not to anybody else but show to me that i could do it and i knew i could and i said i'm a bit radical i would not go back to holland unless it was successful or in a box <laughs> a little bit radical but anyway i felt so strongly about it and then that what did I learn is that, A, I want to share with others that ADHD in particular, but also in terms of 
same as what you were saying. Be at peace with who you are, that everyone is special. And we are too preoccupied about this is not quite right, this doesn't look right on me, and that doesn't look right. I said, be at peace with who you are. You're all special. And the sooner you do and you create that confidence within you that you are okay. You don't have to be special. Nobody is more special than the other. We are all special and unique. And that all gives you then the tools with which you can then survive. And then, uh, you know, education to me has been something that I learned more from life than in the schooling system. But still, uh, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, there is lots and lots of opportunity, but that to me has always been the most important part. Be at peace as to who you are. You know, it's funny because as you're talking and you're telling me about your life, I'm looking at you and listening to you. And I think to myself, of course, he was successful because I feel like wherever you go, whatever you've done, you've been so genuine and people trust you. And so they want to help you because you give yourself. You're just transparent. And um, that's such a beautiful quality. That's such a beautiful quality that, you know, along the same lines is that I think those are some of the hurdles that we as human beings have to overcome. And I think innately God made you that way. Innately God made me a certain, you know, God makes us innately with certain things that we are just gifted in. But I think that's for people to, to use that as an example of giving themselves and being transparent and being open and unafraid, just unafraid. To, to give yourself to be there, to, you know, be comfortable what they say, comfortable in your own skin. That's why I've never done drugs because I was never uncomfortable in my own skin. I've been very comfortable in my, who I am. Like I didn't try to put on facades. If I don't know something, I say, I don't know something. Um, you know, I just sincere and um, I find that in my life, you know, what I see in you is very similar, that people just trust me. People just look at me. They don't, they don't, you know, I had a, I started a business after I left acting because I had that major transition in my life where I met God. And, um, and so that just made me say, wait a second. I did a whole like, wait a second, who am I? what am I? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to this. I, I want you. I want everything of who you are, everything you're about. I just want to know you, whatever that means. I want to know you. But um, um, if, if you the, say I want to know you means I want to know me, right? That's what no, it is. And, and so. No. So did I interrupt you there? Uh, no. Oh, it's okay. Correct. No, I know God. I wanted right. to know the creator that created okay. all of us, created, I, I wanted to know what life was about. Right. You know, I, I, I laugh because how, when I met God, the first question I had was, where do, where do we go? Like, what's this about? Where do we go? And I had like a vision my, in my mind of a bunch of cattle and all the cattle had their butt, their face in the butt, or if you will, the ass of the person ahead of them. Right. And nobody knew where they were going because their head was in the ass of the person ahead of them. Right. And they didn't know that the people ahead were falling off of a ditch. So I was right. like, Father, we go. Which right. where to go? How do we do this? How do we do this thing called life? And I was very much like you. I had no education. I quit high school in no no, no formal education. Formal education. I quit right. in the tenth grade. Yeah. And I had 
and the great education. But I, like you, I've written two books already. I'm, I've already written another book, but, but it's been from not conforming to what, what fear would tell me I have to do, but, 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 but doing my own journey and saying, this is who I am. This is what makes me happy. This is what, you know, ignites me. And I'm okay with that. It, so, it, so, if, so what triggered, you know, so you were successful in Hollywood and you were recognized as a successful actress and model. And then something triggered you other than religion or God, but something triggered you that caused you to say, stop. Because all of a sudden now, the may most people, at least I would look at, is saying, my God, you got it made because you are a, a successful, recognized actress. You are beautiful, obviously. And then, and at the same time, you're an, uh, a, a model, obviously, and, and successful. And then something must have happened that said, stop. I, this, I cannot continue to go in that direction. I must change direction, which was very major. No different than for me in a way, uh, you know, that I knew, although I already was successful in Holland, although I felt I had failed in a way, and, and I was not at peace with myself, I had to remove myself from Holland. And I didn't even tell my parents about it, that I applied to the Canadian Embassy for immigration status, and I didn't want anybody to support me, and, and I wanted to be out of there in three weeks, so because I had to make that change to prove to me that I could do it and start over again and then become successful and nobody ever asked me, where are your diplomas, or what is your religion, or what politi political party, or any of that kind of stuff. It was based on me, and me alone, and hard work, and all the other things. And uh, I, I, So that was a major decision that I made, that where it meant that I was either going to fail or succeed. In my mind, there was no question. I would succeed. I would not give up unless I did. But I had to make that change. Mm -hmm. So for you, it would appear to me to step away from where everybody dreams to be is saying, if I were an actress dealing with you know, these major stars that you have interacted with, Lee Marvin or Danzig or all the other people that everybody knows about or uh, and, and to be recognized by Playboy as uh, a model at one point, I think uh, you, uh, I, I, uh, in, in 1990 or so, you were recognized. So you had reached the top where you can go from there and in, you can direct where you want to go. And it appears to me at some point you said, no, I'm going to go a different direction. Yeah. I was doing a movie and I was waking up in the morning. And you know that time when you just start to wake up, you're not fully awake, but you just start to wake up. You might turn over and go back to sleep a little bit. You're kind of in that twilight. Um, I felt a physical tapping on my finger and I heard a voice very clear that said, isn't the sun beautiful? And the sun was, I kind of peeked and the sun was just coming through the window. And I just responded and said, yes, the sun is beautiful. And then I woke up and I realized what happened. I realized that I heard the voice of God. And so I got on my knees having no religion in my family. I don't come from a religious family. I don't come from a mother never. My mother was just a beautiful girl from Vegas that, you know, was always beautiful. I just always watched my mom putting false eyelashes on and 
dressing up and that was my childhood looking at my mom becoming you know getting made up to be beautiful and um and uh and so i got on my knees and i said lord you've given me this life i've made a mess of it and i said that because i had been married and divorced and to me that was a mess um please I just want to know you. Please just let me serve you. And I saw myself carrying my body, my physical body, and laying them, my body at the feet of Jesus. And that was it. I, after that, um, like that, that same day, I was walking down the street, going to the set while I was doing a movie, and this overwhelming sensation of love just like embraced me and squeezed me and said i love you so much all your dreams will come true and i just stopped and i said what are my dreams i you know i had always dreamed to be an actress that came true but i knew that wasn't my purpose i knew there was something so much more because Acting is wonderful, success is wonderful, but it's not fulfilling in the inside. It doesn't fill you from the inside. It, it, it adorns you on the outside. But for me, finding God, and for me, this is me, finding God and knowing that he was, suddenly that he was real, was like that was everything to me and that i said when i was doing that movie i said this is it for me i am going now and i'm going to find the lord find god and this is going to be my life and um, i had no idea what all that entailed but i was excited and i was overwhelmed with with I knew, like, I understood me inside now. I understood that I was more than a physical being. I was more than just um, a girl that, you know, could be looked at or, you know, overlooked, taken advantage of, or, you know, whatever. I, I was, I was, I was, I was worthy to be loved from the depths of my being. And I had found that in one, one voice and in one day. And I did, I went home from that movie and I found a church and I, I started going to church, although um, I would not go to church to find necessarily think that I would be in church and there's where my relationship with God would be. That church was just an extension. I found intimacy with God. I found literally a father that spoke to me and that held me and his presence came upon me and I could feel that safety and that love and that security and that, that fearlessness that was inside of me that wanted to always live, but then I would bring it back to conform. And, and that was, that was it for me. I just started with the Lord and, um, he's taught me. I've, you know, it's been now 30 years for me walking with the Lord and he has shown me to walk with him in spirit and in truth and to see heaven and to see things in the spirit, like when you pray and you close your eyes. And I, I think there's a, a big misunderstanding with mankind, with humans in relationship to God, that God is in the church. He's there sometimes not always but he's he's there but that's that's a byproduct the god that you come to know is 
intimate with you. He's, he's in your living room. He's in your bedroom. He's, he's when you call on his name. He's when you worship him and say, I want to know you. It's not, it's not a, the corporate thing is, comes out of that intimacy. And I think that's the, um, the diminishing of God in society is that we're trained to think that God is found in the church and left in the church. But the church is a, by, is a byproduct. The God is found face to face. He always was from the beginning in the garden with Adam. It was a face to face relationship of intimacy that is a God that holds your hand and you feel him, that tingling um, electricity from within you that, 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 that is present and you feel him and you hear him. And, you know, he's taught me things that I, I haven't learned from man. I've seen heaven. I, you know, they talk in the church about the three heavens and how the first heaven is the earth and the second heaven is where the powers and principalities of darkness, the war and the heavenlies. And the third heaven is the abode of God. And it's not because I went there. I was lifted out of my spirit and taken and shown the first heaven. The earth is the earth. And the first heaven is where the starry skies are. That is where the, the power and principalities, the war in the heaven, the war over mankind and the soul and the world and all of that is taking place. And the second heaven is paradise. And the third heaven is the city of God. And so the heavens are the totality. But anyway, I've learned. And when you look it up in the Bible, it is completely scriptural not only written in scriptures to Moses on the mountain, but examples of the Garden of Eden. God was in Eden and he built a garden eastward of Eden. That was the garden, the paradise of God. And it's the same with Jerusalem, with um, um, the promised land, you know? And so you see, not only is it scriptural, but it is exemplified in the Bible. And, and it's like, I'm a girl getting back to feeling like a failure. I'm a girl that went to the 10th grade. I, I, there's no way that intellectually that I could figure this Bible out or how the heavens, how they're formed and who's in them and who's not in them. And, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's because there's a God that teaches you. Probably what I'm hearing from you, Terry, is that, uh, you know, that your knowledge is more from experience rather than from somebody telling you what it should be. And uh, uh, you were somewhat before, like, if I look at me, I'm agnostic. And uh, I don't pursue any particular religion. I believe there are things that I don't understand, uh, you know, but I don't need a person to interpret the, uh, the Bible or religion to me because I, I have my relationship and that's what I'm hearing with you is that at that point, you know, that when you woke up and it felt like somebody touched your finger, and said, look outside, that was the changing moment where you said, I'm going to change my life into a different direction, gain the knowledge, not from somebody telling you, but you ex through experience and reading about it and, and, and learning about it for you. And then the other part that, and, and I love what you're telling us and what you're sharing with you, us and your honesty around it uh, is that you want to, you change your life then 
a different direction away from acting and modeling. So where, where did you, at, at, what did you start doing then? Because you've written now two books, you have a third book. You haven't got them with you there that you can show them on the, uh, on, on the picture here. But have you got a website that uh, we can go to or... I do a YouTube, uh, a YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. Um, it's just under Terry Copley and I share the things that father has shown me and taught me. Um, biblically, I do okay. read the Bible. I love to study the Bible. I love to study the Hebrew meaning, the roots of it. I love and it. I, I love that <laughs> yeah you, and you're not stuck to a particular direction or say that's uh, where everybody should go so the other part is that now you're in florida and you're a foster parent tell us uh, our guest uh, you know to to get you know you a little bit more as to what's happening today is that obviously you're at peace with who you are and what you see in your relationship with God uh, and religion. So what are you doing now? And that just before we started the, 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 our podcast, I saw this little girl coming into the picture that I presume is one of your foster children. Actually, I am a grandmother. I'm okay. six two years old and wow. here I, and I um I see I, the heart <laughs> hi that's on the mantle from okay but okay. Cece Scarlett's coming to go pick me up right now. okay um what's her name her name is Sky she's Guy? actually Sky she's my granddaughter okay my I ended up having a, a really bad dream that woke me up at night. Oh, here's my, here's my book, The Three okay. Heavens. I, I love it. Have you got the other one there too? Uh, no. no, I don't have it with me. But um, I had a dream that she was going to drown and I couldn't get to her. And so I woke up panicking and, you know, just pacing. And then I thought I better check in to see how she is. And I, when I did, I found out that she uh, was in a bad situation, a very bad situation. And so I, you know, tried to fight for her. Eventually, I was given a legal guardian of her through the courts. And then my daughter, because my daughter has a drug addiction problem, and that my daughter had another child and a little boy. Um, I named him Seven. I just adopted him. I got him when what he was seven. What is his name? Seven, the number seven. Oh, seven, yeah, interesting. And uh, I got him when he was seven months old and um, I adopted him about a year ago and he's the one, he battles uh, ADHD he battles autism, but it's not the kind of autism where, you know, he's in his own world. He's, he's very connected to what's happening, at, but he is as naughty as all giddy up. He is, has the kind of autism where, you know, he hits you, he tells you to shut up, he calls me a dirty rat, and he's only four and a half years old. Oh. And yeah, he's naughty as can be. I, um, I've, I've never known rejection like I know it now. Um, but I'm so sorry. Um, I've never known rejection like I know it now because he nobody wants him around. But he, I still love. I, um, oh, I'm, you you interrupted your voice. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah go, so go. That's my, those are my foster kids, so to speak. 
So I've changed my life again. I have like literally bought a little house in Florida in a community. So my kids have kids and, you know, I say anybody who lives in California, if you move to Florida, it's like going back 50 years in Florida. I mean, from California, Florida is so beautiful and clean and but anyway, so I came here for a, a simpler life just to raise my grandchildren. Right. And, you know, say to me, how, how, what about your life, Terry? Yeah. And I said, why? I'm 62 years old now. God has given me everything. He allowed me to be an actress, every girl's dream. And yeah. then took me and let me know him. I know you're agnostic. But imagine what it would be like to wake up one day to, to a physical God speaking to you and saying, right. I love you. Exactly. I, I want you. Um, and so I think at this point in my life, if I can't give my life to serving and not think about me, my life, but think about these two lives that have drastically changed my life. I don't go anywhere yeah. anymore. No. I rarely put on, um, you know, I, I would, I would be, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be a very nice person if I no. couldn't, you know? So, but I have a lot of, I have a lot of joy. You know, I, um, I do my YouTube channels. I write my books, I take care of my beautiful, grandchildren as my own on my own a single a single grandma on my own right and you know, sometimes you see me and <laughs> seven's hit let me shut up at me and i'm like sorry <laughs> but um but um you know i enjoy life i you know you I are at peace with who you are and what you're doing and yeah. and and that is the absolute most important thing you know that uh, you know being at peace, uh, and and then seeing your two kids, really yours, around yeah. you, and 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 uh, just the challenges that go with that, obviously. And uh, but at least you feel at peace, and your relationship with God is obviously a close one for you, and and change your life into a, a different direction. The yeah. the so amazing conversation, Terry. Uh, uh, it, it was a privilege for me to be part of your life, and uh, in in I really enjoyed the podcast. I'm going to send you these three books. I'll sign them. Our podcast I'm usually we release them the following day, so they should be available to you as early as tomorrow. We don't do any editing virtually on any of our podcasts. Uh, today I do one. I see your doggy walking there. <laughs> I love I love the animals as well. So the uh, you know so uh, yeah a amazing podcast and uh, let's make sure we stay in touch and uh, and and uh, you know the uh, stay in touch with you and. Uh, and then maybe in another six months or so, we'll give you another call and see if we can do another updated podcast together. Okay. I just want to say it was a pleasure to meet you. I'm honored to meet you. I see your spirit. I see how beautiful God made you. And I completely understand your success. I, I genuinely, you know, there's not a lot of people that have that, childlike view of life and i cherish that when i see it in people so i just want to bless you and i'm going to be praying for you that you meet god too because there's nothing like it no i i love it uh, uh cherry and uh again thanks for your podcast and uh, you take care of yourself and uh, again thanks uh, it was a privilege you too. God bless you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.